Well, good morning, Kirby. Good to see you. Trust the Lord has been gracious and merciful to you this week as he has me. And just grateful to be back where we can worship today. I'll ask you to turn with me again uh, this morning to the book of James chapter 4. Uh, today and one more Sunday we'll conclude our series on measuring my maturity. I hope that this has been helpful uh, in you personally and subjectively uh, evaluating where you are in terms of your growth in Christ. It's been a hard series. Uh, to be honest with you, I kind of, uh, I kind of argued with the Lord about uh, preaching this series uh, as a first series here. But I really believe the Lord, uh, even though it's hard, every time the Lord convicts us, it's always for a good reason. Uh, he's trying to, he's trying to help us, not hurt us. And uh, I hope you know that we. Uh, we share these messages with you out of a heart of love and desire that God would work in my life as well as yours. Today we're going to be dealing with chapter 4 verse 11 and we're going to go through chapter 5 and verse 6. And the title of the message today very simply is this, Stop Playing God. Stop playing God. And uh, you'll understand why I've entitled that in just a few moments. James chapter 4 verses 11 through chapter 5 verse 6. A number of years ago, a million miles from here, and a million years ago, I guess I could say, I attended a funeral. It was a funeral of a church member where I was at pastoring at that time. It was a family member. And I was interested in the choice of songs that the man had selected to be sung at his funeral. It was an old, it was a song popularized by Frank Sinatra and many others. But the title of the song was, you probably can guess it, I Did It My Way. I Did It My Way. Well, I didn't really, I wasn't able to concentrate enough to pick up on the lyrics of the song, so I looked it up later, and this is what I found is the words to the last verse in that song that the man had sung at his funeral. He said, For what is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not. Not to say things that he truly feels, and not the words of someone who kneels. Let the record show. I took all the blows and I did it my way. That sounds noble. And not the words of someone who kneels. I'm going to do it myself. I'll be master of my own fate, captain of my own ship. George Burns and Morgan Freeman are not the first two, neither will they be the last two to play God. Play God. Remember those two movies? I never could go to see them. I didn't want to see them. I was afraid God would strike me with lightning if I went to see them. I, I, just, I just saw anything that tries to represent God in that kind of way. I, uh, that's If you went to see it, fine. But I, I did read all the reviews and I know what the movie was about. Have you ever tried to play God with yourself? 
or with others. In James chapter 4, he, he really talks about playing God. And I want you to look with me in chapter 4. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 11. I read 11 through 13 last week. We're going to pick it up and, and read a little further. He says, do not slander or speak evil of one another, brethren. Uh, just notice how many times the word brethren is mentioned in this text. And by that you will conclude that he's writing to Christians. He's writing to believers. And, but they're, they're struggling in their relationship. And he says, he who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Who are you to judge another? I had a close friend, preacher friend, again a million years ago, who ran into a, a mutual acquaintance of both he and myself. And in this setting they began to talk about, I, my name came up. And uh, the, uh, the fellow asked my preacher friend, do you know Tommy Vinson? He said, yes, I know Brother Tommy. He's a, he's a good old boy. We know when you're from Mississippi, that's what you are. You're a good old boy. And the other man said, he is a good old boy, but he's going to hell. My preacher friend, who is somewhat feisty and fiery, jumped up from his seat and said, who are you? God. Let me ask you today that same question. Who are you? God. Now, I think all of us in this room would probably answer why no, we're not God. But if we will seriously consider the facts of our life we have to admit that in po some points along the way, we play God in our lives. You see, playing God is the original sin. When you trace the origin of sin in the universe, you have to trace it back to two places, Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. And so in Isaiah chapter 14, uh, we, we hear these words, and this is, a, this is Lucifer speaking. Lucifer used to be one of the highest, most beautiful created angels in the universe. But Lucifer made a decision to play God and to usurp the authority of God in his existence. And so in Isaiah chapter 14, he says, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning. That phrase, star of the morning, is a reference to angels. Angels are called stars of the morning. Son of the dawn, you have been cut down to earth. In other words, you've fallen from that high position as a beautiful created angel. You who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Now you'll notice that the original sin in this universe was the angel saying, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Now notice what he said. He said, I, I'm, I will ascend to heaven. Now that's a noble aspiration, right? Uh, ha have a heavenly devil. The devil said, I want to go to heaven. But you see, 
the text lets us know that he wanted to go to heaven not as a guest and not because of the grace of the Father in heaven toward him. He wanted to go to heaven to rule over everything else. His aspiration, his desire was to be in control. And so he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Now that term, stars of God, refers to all the other angels. And he says, I will raise my throne above all the other angels' thrones. In other words, I'll not only go to heaven, I'll be over all of the angelic creation. In other words, I'm going to be God. I'm going to usurp the place of God and serve as God. He said, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. That's a phrase that refers to authority. He said, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to rule over the angels. I'm going to be in charge. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Now, what does that mean? That means the clouds refer to the Shekinah glory cloud of God, the manifested presence of God. Now, notice what he's saying. He said, I'm going to ascend above the clouds. I'm going to ascend above the manifested presence of God. In other words, I'm going to push God aside. I'm going to say to God, there's room for me on your throne. Scoot over. So Satan wants to play God. But then here's the clincher. He says, I will make myself like the Most High. Now, I have a question. How in the world can a created angel make themselves like the Most High? How can Lucifer ever be in any way like God? He's a created being. God is a non-created being. God has existed from eternity. Lucifer, the angels, have existed only for a period of time. God created them. There was a time when there was no angels, and God created the angels. So how can Lucifer say, I'm going to be like the Most High God? Only one way. He can never be like God in that he's omnipotent because Lucifer can never be all-powerful. Listen, dear friends, the devil wants you to believe that he can do anything. He's a liar. The devil is not omnipotent. He wants you to believe he is. And let me tell you something else. The devil is not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere all the time. He wants you to think he is. But he can't. He's not all powerful and he isn't omniscient. What do I mean by that? I mean the devil doesn't know everything. He wants you to think he does, but the devil doesn't know everything. God is omnipotent. He has all power. God is omniscient. He knows everything. And God is omnipresent. He can be everywhere at the same time. So how can a created being who's not omnipresent, omniscient, Be like a God who is. Only one way. He said, I want to be like the Most High God in the sense that I call all the shots. I'm in charge. I'm the one who is the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my ship. And you see, Eve believed him. Because he came to Eve and he said, if you'll just eat of the fruit of that tree, then you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And Eve bought into his lie. She said, if I will listen to the devil and I will bite this apple, if I'll do his will instead of God's will, it's going to, make me, it's going to bring me full satisfaction, real happiness. And boy, I'll, I'll really have everything I want in life. But how many of you know the devil has a lot more in the show window than he has in the warehouse? He'll offer you the world and he'll deliver to you heartache. The devil wants us to do like him and play God. Harold Bryson, who was professor at New Orleans Seminary, defined sin this way. I, I thought it was an interesting definition. He said, sin is the silly game of trying to be God. 
That's the definition of sin. Playing God. Now, the ground rules for this game are to think, speak, and act as if you were God rather than being submissive to the God who is God. Now, our text reveals two areas where we need to stop playing God. The first one I've already read in verses 11 through 13, and that is we need to stop playing God with others. He, notice he said, do not speak evil of, of one another, brothers. He's saying that, that uh, when we begin to do that, we are assuming a position of authority over others, and we are playing God for them. You see, it's easier to criticize and judge others than to judge ourselves and to repent of our own sin. A common statement often heard in the early church was this, Behold how they love one another. May that always be true, but sometimes it's not as the world looks on. Peter teaches us that when the truth about a brother is harmful, we should cover it in love rather than repeat it in criticism. Listen to what he said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. I love that poem. If you see a tall fellow ahead of the crowd, a leader of men, walking fearless and proud, and you know of a tale who mere telling aloud will cause his proud head to an anguish be bowed, it's a pretty good thing to forget it. That's what he's saying. Stop playing God with others. With others. I like what Warren Wiersbe says, and I'm going to give you his, uh, rather, uh, uh, one commentary I read said, to disparage a brother or sister disparages God's law. The royal law insists that believers love one another. To slander a brother attacks the king of the laws. Such harsh criticism gives a declaration of independence from God's reign and rule. Why? Because the law is an expression of God's character. It's not just an arbitrary collection of possible commands. Well, the rabbis used to have a term for it. They called it the third tongue. You ever heard that term? I'd never heard of it. The third tongue. And, and they say that the third tongue is what this text is talking about, is criticizing a fellow believer. You see, the third tongue kills three people. The one who speaks, the one who listens, and the one who is spoken about. Playing God in others. You know, sometimes we do that because we impose our demands on other people that are not scriptural. I remember as a young Christian, some of the people that discipled me, they were good intentioned, but they put their convictions off on me. And rather than allowing me by the Holy Spirit to find God's conviction in my life, they tried to impose and put a standard of what is holy and what is not holy that was not scriptural. How long your hair was, what kind of shirts you wore, you know, how you, sometimes even how you pronounce the word God. <laughs> and we get our own little, little group together and we begin to set up our standards. If we're not careful, we'll play God in people's lives rather than helping them to find the place of God in their life. Well, then secondly, let me just say, we need to stop playing God with, not just with others, but with ourselves. Look what he says here in verses 13 through 17. He says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Now, see, there's nothing wrong in what he said. This is a businessman laying out his business plan. He's saying, We're going to go to this city at this time and we're going to do this business adventure and we hope to make a profit. That sounds good, doesn't it? Yet, he says, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. 
But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does it not, to him it is sin. The one who knows what to do and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. Now, he's saying here that we play God by our attitude toward God's will. These these people were ignoring God in the process. Now, the Lord doesn't reprimand them for planning, for laying out their business plan. There's nothing wrong with that. The only problem was that they left God out of the whole process. God was never in their mind, nor in any of their decision making. When a believer steps outside the will of God, it always, listen to this, brings trouble in its wake. Amen. Have you noticed that? Whenever we step out, it, in those times when I've said no to God and yes to self, it always brings in its wake heartache. You know, uh, Lot moved to Sodom and he brought trouble to his whole family. Do you notice that? He stepped outside the will of God, but his whole family paid the consequences. David committed adultery and brought trouble to his family and to his kingdom. Jonah disobeyed God and almost sent a shipload of heathen sailors to their watery grave. You see, we, when a believer steps outside the will of God, he not only hurts himself, but he hurts those around him. That's why the Scripture says in Proverbs 27, 1, Boast not yourself of tomorrow, for you don't know what another day may bring forth. What was the problem? Well, the problem was they were, <laughs> they were living like atheists while professing to be Christians. You know anybody like that? There's a term for that. It's called practical atheism. They were living like God didn't exist. Now, in their minds, they, God's back there somewhere, but He has no impact on the decisions that they're making. And so, they, in essence, are usurping the place of God in their life. You see, the truth is, they were saying, we're going to go to this city or that city tomorrow. And the truth is, nobody knows anything about tomorrow, right? Nobody does. Raphael, the great artist, thought that the next day, his tomorrow, he would finish the great work of art, his painting. But the next day, that great work of art followed him, unfinished, in his funeral possession procession. Charles Dickens, the great novelist, you know, he, he thought that he would finish his magnum opus, his great novel tomorrow. But he never finished it. You see, we don't know about tomorrow. So we shouldn't boast about tomorrow. Uh, scripture says in 2 Corinthians 6 2, Behold, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. So, church, whatever we're going to do for God, we need to do it now. Amen? Whatever we're going to do for God, we need to do it while we can, while we have this time. I remember Paul writing to Timothy, and he said, Timothy, come to see me. I'm in jail. I'm dying. They're going to cut my head off any time now. And he said to Timothy, Timothy, come before winter. Now, why did he say that? Because he knew if Timothy didn't come before winter, then it was going to lock up the harbor in the wintertime, and he couldn't come until spring. And Paul is saying, Timothy, if you don't come until spring, I'll be dead. It'll be too late. You see, we can't boast about tomorrow. You remember when you were in school having to read Sir Walter Scott? His diaries were famous, but on the last day of his life, he wrote these words, Tomorrow we shall. He never finished the sentence. Tomorrow we shall. It used to be that whenever you would write a letter, 
below your signature, you would always put DV. It was considered rude if you didn't put DV. It stood for Deo Volte, which means God willing. God willing. Jesus talked about a, a man whose life was taken over by his business, like these businessmen. Listen to what he said about it. He told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the thing you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Secondly, we play God by disobeying God's will. Disobeying God's will. Not only by ignoring God's will, but disobeying it when we do know what it is. Notice what he said, he that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Dr. Rogers used to tell about this man who was hiring a, a chauffeur. And the way that he would test the potential candidates was he would question them and then he would take them out in his yard and there was a big drop off in his yard that went off hundreds of feet. <laughs> and he would always ask the candidates, how close can you get to that ledge in your driving? And different ones would say, boy, I can get within five feet of that. Another would say, well, I can get within three feet of that. And one very uh, aggressive candidate said, why, I can get within 18 inches of that ledge. Then he interviewed the fourth guy. <laughs> he said, how close can you get to that ledge? The man looked at the ledge, looked at the guy interviewing him and said, sir, let me tell you something. I wouldn't get within 20 feet of that ledge. He said, you're hired. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you see, our problem is sometimes we want to see how we can bump the edge. How close we can get to sin without stepping over. But you see, the, the true disciple of Jesus, his attitude is not seeing how close he can get, but his desire is to see how he can walk with Christ and how he can avoid doing those things which grieve God's Spirit and quench God's Spirit in his life. When a child deliberately disobeys the known will of God, then the father steps in and disciples him and, and, and disciplines him. Uh, that's what Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 5. He says, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline of which you have all become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. You see, I, I thank God for the discipline. Don't you? I mean, I thank God that when I step outside the will of God, God disciplines me. I know it when I step outside the will of God. My heart is convicted. And I thank God for that. It's a sign that God loves me. It's a sign that I belong to Him. And that discipline, that, that, even that chastening is a sign of God's grace and love. If God didn't love me, He wouldn't care. But He loves me too much to let me go on in my sin without convicting me. And then can I just say, the last thing I want to say today is that we play God by the use of our wealth. We play God by how we use what God has placed at our disposal. Listen to what he says. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries, 
which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted. Basically, wealth in those days consisted of three things, food, clothing, and gold or silver. And he uses all three of them here. He says, your food has rotted, rotted in the barn. Your clothing, moths have eaten them up. And your gold and silver, it's corroded over. What he's talking about is the temporariness, the transitoriness of wealth. He said, uh, um, your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Seboeth, or the Lord of the armies. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your heart in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. In those days, the Old Testament made it a, a matter of law that if you hired somebody to do a, a job for a day, at the end of the day, you paid them. Because in those days, their food, their shelter, their survival was dependent on what they made that day. You know, we, we, we live to eat. But in Bible days, most of the people uh, ate to live. When I go to India, a lot of the people I meet with, they, they don't eat to live. I mean, live to eat, they eat to live. Every day, they're dependent upon daily bread. And so when they pray the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, they mean it. They mean it. That's how close they live. And so that's what he's talking about here. These rich people would hire these folks to mow their pastures and then not pay them. And because of their wealth, they were in with the judges, and politically they had power, and so they could get by with it. They were playing God with their wealth. Somebody said, if money talks, all it ever says to me is bye-bye. You know, how we use what God puts in our, in our possession is a great barometer on where we are spiritually. Can I applaud this church? This church has led the way in Memphis, Tennessee, in this area of Christian discipleship. This church is known all over the Southern Baptist Convention as a generous, loving, giving church. And I applaud you for that. And I'll tell you, it's a great barometer. Amen. I do. It's a great barometer. You, 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 that's something to applaud yourself for. God's blessed you. And I, I, I tell you, I rejoice with you in that. Because it's a barometer on where your heart is. The Scripture says where, where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. And where your treasure is. <laughs> Let me turn that around. That's the way the Scripture really says Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Jeremiah twenty-two thirteen 13 says, Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice, who makes his neighbor serve him for nothing and does not give him wages. Hey, how we, how we, how we use our, our resources is a great barometer on our maturity. Well, I guess the way to summarize that is to, just to say this, and I'm closing. If God has not touched your pocketbook, in all likelihood He has not touched you. To try to hold on to money is an act of independence. Jesus said it this way, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys 
where thieves do not break in and steal. Listen to this, for where your treasure is, that's what we just said, there your heart will be. So stop playing God to others. Stop playing God for yourself and start pursuing God. Look at chapter 4, verse 8. It's our closing verse. Draw near unto God. See that? Draw near unto God, and He will draw near unto you. Isn't that a great word? God is saying, draw near unto God. And that word draw is a strong word. It's a word that, that's more than just a casual word. Draw. It's, a, it's a word that has intensity to it. Getting serious about drawing near to God. You see, when we draw near to God, guess what? We get to know God better. Amen? Because the way you get to know somebody is spend time with them. You get to know God when you pray, when you read His Word, when you come to worship. Draw near unto God because when you draw near to God, you get to know one another. You know, when I counsel couples that are getting married, I always draw a triangle. I put God at the top, the bride at one corner, the groom at the other. And I talk about how the way that they gain intimacy with one another this way is by moving together this way toward God. And as they move toward God up the triangle, guess what? The distance between them is diminished. So they grow closer to one another by growing closer to God. Scripture says, draw near unto God. Draw near unto God for the same reason the prodigal son did. He said, I, I've, I've sat in this hog pen long enough. He said, I've fed these pigs long enough. It's time for me to get up out of this filth and go to my father. And he got up. And he drew near to his father. And what did the father do? He saw him coming. And he ran to meet him. Not to reprimand him and say, look what you've done. No, to love him. To love him. To get a ring and put on his hand. Shoes, put on his feet. And to love him. You see, when you draw near to God, you experience forgiveness and grace and mercy. Hey, anybody in this room say it's time? Who are you? God? No. You're not God, and I'm not God. There's only one God. And he loves you. And he sent his son to die for you. Many years ago, a man by the name of Dr. Cleland McAfee was a longtime pastor and a professor in a Christian college. And on a certain uh, short period of time, two of his brother's daughters died of diphtheria. Actually, they were in a pandemic. This is not the first pandemic, by the way. And these two little girls died. And this double catastrophe really broke Dr. McAfee's heart. And the situation was made worse, and we understand this by what's happening in our world today, by the fact that his brother's house had to be quarantined to prevent the spread of the terrifying diphtheria. People were unable to go inside to express their condolences, and the family could not be permitted to leave the house to, even to attend the funeral services. McAfee sat up late that night praying and wondering what he could say the following Sunday to bring comfort to his family and his congregation. And out of a broken heart, a wonderful hymn was born. The choir learned to sing it on their Saturday night choir rehearsal. 
And from there they went to the quarantined home of Howard McAfee, the brother of the preacher. And standing outside that quarantined house where the windows were darkened, they sang this new hymn. And then the next day they sang it for the first time in their congregation. Let me close this sermon with the words to that hymn. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. The chorus says, O Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before Thee near to the heart of God. There is a place of comfort sweet near to the heart of God. A place where we, our Savior, meet near to the heart of God. What did James say? Draw near unto me, and I will draw near unto you. Will you pray with me? Father, I don't know about everybody else in this room, but I do know that there has been times in my own life when I've taken the reins and I've ask you to scoot over on the throne and I've had the audacity the pride the presumption to try to control my own life and Lord every time I've done it I've left pain and disappointment in my own heart and in the hearts of others in the wake of that and I repent of that I'm sorry God, I pray that you would search us and know our heart, that you would try us and know our thoughts. And Lord, if there's any wicked way in us, that you would cleanse us and forgive us today. Lord Jesus, forgive us for playing God in our own life and in the lives of others. God, forgive us. We bow and submit and humble ourselves before the one true God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now today with our heads bowed, I just want to encourage you. If you've never done that, or if it's been a long time since you've just come before the throne of the Father, draw near to Him. Why don't you do it right now? Why don't you tell Him, Lord, I want to draw near to your heart. And in drawing near to you, I want to experience what that prodigal son experienced. I want to experience your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. I want to get to know you and love you. Would you pray that right now, right where you're seated? In a moment, we're going to stand and sing a hymn of appeal. If you need to come and kneel here at this altar, do business with the Holy Spirit, please don't hesitate to do that. If you're looking for a church home, we invite you to come. Put your life and membership here at Kirby. We would welcome you, and I know this church would. However the Lord may be leading you today, just be obedient to Him while we sing. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we worship the Lord.